Sure. Okay. Uh, okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, week's Chrome seminar. And our first talk is given by uh, two two people, uh, Jen Hendrik Bastak and Denise Kochman from ETH Zurich, uh, Switzerland. And Jen Hendrik is a PhD student at the Mechanics and Materials Lab, and his interest lies at the intersection of mechanics and machine learning. Dennis is a professor of mechanics and materials, and he is also currently the deputy head of the department. His research focuses on the links between microstructure and properties of natural and architected materials. Uh, so without further ado, welcome, guys. Uh, you may want to start a presentation. Do you have access, access to the... Are you able to share your screen? Oh, uh, unfortunately not, to... no. Yeah. It says host disabled participants can share. Uh, yeah, I just made you a co-host. So you may want to try it again. Thanks. Yeah. One second. So you should be able to see the slide. Yeah. That's correct. Yes. Perfect. All right, so, then Go ahead. so then I'll start. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to present here um, about physics and formal neural networks. We split up a bit, so I'll, I'll entertain you for the first 10, 15 minutes or so and introduce the topic, and then Ian Hendrik will take over with some of the, the technical details. And I thought, you know, since we're at Brown here and we are far away, I'd give you just one slide on uh, who we are and, and where we are, but I'm not sure I can. Yeah, now it's working. So this is our lab. What's a bit specific about us is that we do computational mechanics, theoretical mechanics, but we also do quite a bit of experiments. And so we're a bit of a mix of experimentalists, theoreticians, and, and modelers. And we're situated in Zurich. So if you ever swing by Europe, feel free to pay us a visit. This is where we are sitting. And this is the view from our offices, just to uh, you know, tease you a little bit. And what we do is mechanics of materials. And so to introduce this quickly, let me put this into a bigger picture so you understand what we're doing and then we'll see where the pins fit in. What we do a lot is we try to understand where material properties come from. And so if you think about classical materials, for example, we know that those derive their properties from composition and microstructure. If you zoom into lower scales, we'll start to understand where material properties come from. And ultimately, of course, this gives rise to, if you then perform an experiment, the microscopic response. The stress strain curve comes from microstructural features and the key is to understand the link between microstructural features and microscopic properties. And then, of course, we also work a lot on what's known as architected materials. And I'm not sure if Jan Henry can press the next button because I cannot uh, use the movie here. Um, what happens here is if you zoom into lower scales, you will not simply find microstructure as materials, but you will find structure, structural features. And we can use this very deliberately to make materials with designer properties. So if you want materials that have low density, but high stiffness, high strength, high toughness or whatnot. This is a way to do it because you can use the structural architecture as a turning knob essentially to tune the microscopic properties. And so what we'd like to do is understand the link between structure and properties. And you can think about this pretty much as the QR code, you know, that we all understand, which encodes the URL. In this case, it's the microstructure, which encodes the microscopic properties of these materials. And the key challenges that come up in this context then are of course in the computational realm, this is where we are. And there are two directions that we typically think about. And the first one is modeling. If you hand me a certain structural architecture, what are the effective properties? Especially if you make your structures finer and finer and finer, the structure turns into a continuum, into a material. And this is a modeling challenge. So we need to predict the effective response. And this requires a lot of computational mechanics modeling. And then there's a second challenge which is the inverse design. Then Henrik, would you please mute? There's a lot of background noise on your end. Sorry for that, yeah. And the opposite challenge, as I said, is the, the inverse design. And the problem here is that you want to... No, I was muted for some reason. Um, how do you have to do this at the smaller scales? And so if we want to do this, of course, we can do it with classical techniques, but also there are lots of opportunities for machine learning. And this is where we first came into contact with machine learning in trying to understand both how to better model, but especially how to do the inverse design. 
And just to give you a flavor of this, this is not what we'll be talking about today, but this is what we first got into contact with neural nets and machine learning. And this was the inverse design. So imagine that you want to make structures that have certain properties. Imagine that you want to make trust structures. I'm showing three examples on, on the left up here. Each of them has very specific properties. Shown underneath are what we call the elastic surfaces, meaning if you measure the mechanical Young's modulus, the uniaxial stiffness in different directions, this is what this would look like in 3D. And now if you come and say, I want a query, I want a certain property, and how do you make the trust that corresponds to that? So you come to me with target properties and I'm supposed to predict an architecture that has this. This is an inherently ill-posed problem. This is something that we've dealt with very nicely with machine learning. And you can see the citation at the bottom if you're interested in these kind of problems. But these trusses, as I was showing here, have a dark side. And this is one of the reasons why we've gone away, among others, from these trust-based metamaterials. And this is why we're interested in shells, to, to finally get to the point of what we want to talk about today. Um, whenever you have trusses, you have one problem, which is you have very high stress concentrations. And what this means is if you load these structures, you will have very high stresses wherever you have junctions of trusses, of plates, of whatnot. And these lead to low strength, low resilience. They basically lead to early onset of failure. And of course, if you look into nature, we typically don't find these sharp junctions. There are no truss or plate-based you know, architectures in nature. Nature typically tends to be smooth, non-periodic, and very often shell-based. And that's one of the reasons why we've been working for quite a while now also on non-periodic shell-based architectures. And the idea here is that, can we make shells that have designer properties? And again, you would go in the box on the left, you would generate a training set where you essentially generate a whole bunch of architectures, try to find their effective response, their effective properties, and then try to learn how to go from a property query to an output, which is a real world structure that we can make in the lab. And this again is a very nice challenge. You can see the, the reference in the bottom corner that we've dealt with, mach with machine learning. And these shell structures, uh, you can do all kinds of things with. Um, here are some examples of spatially graded structures where you can change the properties from one end to the other very beautifully. You can also make them in the lab. This was a collaboration with Carlos Portela and Julia Greer at Caltech, where we make these, or they actually make these small scale architectures, shell based architectures. If you zoom in more and more and more, you will find those, and these are thin shell architectures. In this case, it's a, a very unique one that has a shell thickness on the order of just 10 to 20 nanometers. You can even look through it under the transmission electron microscope. And these materials can have very peculiar features. Among others, if you take this, and here's an example of, a, of such an architecture that's made out of a ceramic. And if you take this and you compress it, what's gonna happen is what you see in this movie over here, Imagine you take your favorite vase made out of ceramic and now you compress it to 30% of its initial height. Normally it crumbles and fails, um, but in this particular case here, it doesn't. And there are a number of things that come together. One of them is that at small scales, we have material size effects. Another one is that um, we are pretty much defect free at these scales. But most importantly, we have shell-based architectures, very thin shells that behave pretty much like elastic shells which can crumble, which can buckle, which can undergo all kinds of large deformation without failing. And so this is essentially elastic shell buckling. And that's one of the reasons why we're very much interested in the behavior of shells. Shells essentially are nothing else but thin structures, which are much thinner in one direction than in the other extensions. And the mechanics of those have been puzzling at least the computational mechanics community for a long time. And so with this, let me try to, if I can, go to the next slide. Um, where I want to introduce what we're mainly going to talk about, which is the modeling of shells. Now, previously I gave you the motivation why we talk about shells. Now the question is how do we model those? And of course, you may think, you know, finite elements are all around and shell-based modeling is, is a classic and abacus ends and whatnot, but there are significant challenges. And I'll quickly show you what those are. And then Jan Henrik will, will take over and show you how to deal with this with pins. And so first things first, a little bit of notation. Imagine that you have a shell, which we consider in two configurations. What you see in the middle is a flat initial configuration. And now we imagine that every point from this flat configuration, little omega, is mapped into this curved uh, shell that you see in the top right corner that we call capital omega. And I use C1 and C2 as the coordinates to describe a point inside this domain. In the reference configuration, little omega, C1 and C2 can simply be an ortho, uh, orthogonal orthonormal grid. 
In the current configuration, in the actual configuration, these, of course, turn into curved trajectories. And we describe the shell mid-surface. Think about it as you know, a constant thickness object, which has a mid-surface. And that is curved, and we describe it by a chart, which I call phi over here. And this phi essentially assigns to every point in the flat reference configuration a point in the curved 3D real space configuration of the shell. And now just for notational purposes, in the current uh, you know, real physical configuration on the, on the right, we can use concepts from differential geometry to also attach a frame to every point. For example, if you consider this point P, which is mapped onto the point on the right, Locally, we can attach a basis, A1, A2, and A3. A1 and A2 are obtained by differentiating the chart with respect to the two coordinates, C1 and C2. And this essentially yields two vectors, not necessarily uh, orthonormal, but always inside the tangent plane of the shell at the point. And then the third vector, A3, we define as the one that is perpendicular to the two, meaning we always get a third vector that points out of the plane. And this is how we essentially try to, or remember how we try to, how we describe uh, the shell. Now, the shell can deform, of course. We're talking about mechanics, so we'd like to understand how it moves, how it deforms. And the most general model that we want to, to deal with here is the so-called five-parameter NACD shell model. And this model basically assumes that every point P inside the shell has five degrees of freedom. And we have three translations. Every point can move freely in 3D space, so we have three displacement components. And on top of this, there are two rotational components, which are shown on the left as theta one and theta two. And this basically is nothing else, but if you can see my video, if you have the plane, you can uh, rotate locally uh, about the two axes, A1 and A2. We don't take into account what's known as drilling. That would be a rotation about A3. We can discuss this separately, um, but in the most general case here, uh, one usually doesn't need that, so we can leave this out. But this gives us five degrees of freedom. There's a field uh, which at every point assigns these five degrees of freedom to a point on the shell. And then if you think about the displacement that results from this, it's shown in the bottom, this capital U, every point P inside the real shell is now deforming. Of course, first of all, the point is moving with little u, the three components that tell us how the point is moving. And then on top of this, we have to think about the shell as not being an infinitely thin object, but it is an object that has a finite thickness. And whenever you have a finite thickness, think about a plate or so, when you start to add curvature, then every point inside the plate can also start moving left or right. So for example, if you take a cross section and you, you know, att uh, attach curvature like this, points at the top will move to the left, points at the bottom will move to the right. And this is essentially what we know from plate bending or Euler-Bernoulli beam theory and, and whatnot. And this is essentially the second term of the displacement that we see at the bottom. So the first one is essentially the motion of the mid-surface and on top of this, we have motion that depends on C3, which is the third dimension. It's the coordinate that goes through the thickness. And this has to deal with the two rotational degrees of freedom. So if you're tilting about the two axes, you get displacements of every point that's not on the mid-surface because of that. <clears throat> now, a bit more math here. Um, we need to go to strains ultimately to stresses and energy in order to describe the mechanics of, of, of these objects. And what we principally can do here is derive a strain tensor. We all know our E or epsilon ij, ui comma j plus uj comma i. Here in this context, this is a, a lot more complicated because we are not in a Cartesian Euclidean sense, but we're on a curve manifold. So what one can do is one can, of course, compute strain components again, and we can classify them into three kinds. This is what we see here. The first one, let me be a bit more specific, um, these are membrane strains. These E alpha, beta, alpha and beta are one and two, are basically strain components inside the plane. Imagine that you take a sheet and you strain it in the plane, and these are the membrane strains. We have to be a little careful here because all these derivatives, which we classically take, are now on a curved manifold, which is why we need these surface covariant derivatives, which contain the classical derivatives, but additional terms that come from the differential, uh, differential geometry of the shell. And also the curvature tensor enters because if you add curvature, this gives rise to membrane strains as well. This is membrane stretching, essentially 2D deformation of the shell. If you now add bending, then you will also have bending strains. This K alpha beta, again, alpha and beta range from one to two. These are stra strain components that arise in the plane because of bending. So if you bend the sheet, you understand that there is compressive strains at the top, tensile strains at the bottom. 
we can bend about two axes, therefore we have to be in 2D. And of course, the principal axes of bending don't have to be aligned with uh, A1 and A2. And that's why this also is a, a, a second order tensor over here. And then finally, there are shear strains as well. And these shear strains come because we consider a finite thickness. When you have a finite thickness and you bend this thing, there will also be shear strains, which are essentially pointing in the normal direction onto the plane, both on the two and the three surface. So we'll have these two shear strains that enter as well. All other strain components that one could consider are of higher order, and especially for shells, which are you know, relatively thin, uh, they will disappear. So this is all we have to consider. And now, once we have these strains, we would stick them into the energy. We like variational approaches. So for example, you could take the, st the stored strain energy density, plug those strains in. And what you're getting then is, is this over here. What we see at the top is the total potential energy. We integrate over the shell, for example, conveniently in the reference configuration. And what do we integrate? There are three terms here. The first one is essentially the elastic energy because of membrane stretches. And the CIJKL or alpha, beta, sigma, rho over here is nothing else but our, our classical elastic modulus tensor, now written in uh, you know, this uh, uh, curved space. The first is, is membrane strains. The second one is because of curvature. And the third one is because of the shear components, which includes the shear correction factor. And this D down here is nothing else but basically the shear modulus, if you will. If there are external loads, we subtract those. And then as usual in mechanics, we try to find the solution by minimizing this potential with respect to the fields of displacements and of rotations, of course, subject to boundary conditions and, and, and whatnot. Uh, but this essentially is the variational problem we have to solve. Typically, what we can also do in this, this, this uh, setting is we can come up with what we call a strong form. Minimizing the variational is usually the weak form. You can turn this into a strong form if we define, for example, membrane forces, bending moments, and shear forces. And with those, we can also turn this minimization problem into essentially the stationary conditions that come out. In classical mechanics, we would minimize the energy, and then we know this is equivalent to the divergence of my stress tensor being zero. Here, it's a bit more complicated because we have to deal with all kinds of different structural components. So here we'd have a divergence of my, my bending moment, M minus uh, Q, uh, the shear forces has to be zero. And there are two additional conditions to be satisfied that also in, uh, involve body forces, flat boundary conditions. But this is essentially the set of equations that we want to solve if we want to model shells. And of course, this has been around for decades and in principle, it looks relatively easy. We have to find two you know, uh, vector fields over here over a curved domain. We know how to do it by minimizing this or solving these, easy. The problem is, or one of the problems- Sorry, can I, Dennis, can I, can I ask yes. a quick question? Is Please. that, for the strong form of the PDE, is that in the deformed configuration? And should we interpret that as the surface divergence? Oh, you mean this down here? Uh, yeah. Yes, you can formulate it both ways, I guess. But in this case, I would say yes. I see. Okay, thank you. I mean, you can formulate it both ways. You can formulate it in the reference configuration by 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 pulling it back, or in the current configuration, in the, in the real physical configurations. Dennis, I have another question on uh, because you show these nice movies with um, mm -hmm. materials which are not homogeneous, but here uh, you uh, all these kappas and the C AEs and so on. These are all homogenized variables, right? So we forget yes. about the microstructure and uh, okay. Yes, so I used the, the beginning just as a teaser for what we do in general. But here, of course, we treat the simplest thing possible, meaning it's a homogeneous material. We assume homogeneous constant, uh, elastic constants throughout. We also assume a constant thickness, which, of course, we can change all of this. Uh, it doesn't change any of the validity of what we're doing. Um, it just makes it a bit more complicated. So here, I'm just writing down the, the simplest thing possible. But of course, we can make it more complicated as we wish. Um, in fact, changing thickness or, or these kind of things we're looking into indeed in the context of topology optimization. Um, but this, I, uh, I just like to keep under the rug here for simplicity. Yes, I should think. Thank you. All right, so the problem I was trying to point out is if, if you look at this energy functional, there's one crux here. And, and the problem is that if you look at the membrane energy, the first term, and the shear energy, the last term, we scale with T, with the thickness of the shell. But the second term, which is the one associated with bending, it scales with t to the power of three. 
And this unfortunately has severe consequences, especially if you're considering shells, which are not thick, but which go towards the thin thickness limit. So if T becomes very small, these terms scale very, very differently. And even if you're careful with rescaling and rewriting, this is a dilemma, because if you have uh, conditions where you have either pure bending or very strong bending uh, involved, then this typically causes problems. And people have come up with all kinds of remedies for this, of course, very successful remedies in the fine element context. Uh, there are mixed uh, interpolation orders of tensor components. There's partial selective reduced integration, where you try to be smart about how to integrate this to make sure that you don't get locking, which basically means that this, this, uh, the shell behaves way too stiff in the thin thickness limit, because this is really what happens usually. But these are all tricks, and one has to play a lot of tricks to make this work. And, and this is one of the issues uh, that we typically have when we deal with shell modeling. And this is one of the of, of the points where you know we, we thought, can we do things a bit differently? And uh, Jan Hendrik, of course, had great ideas of how to do this with pins. And that's why at this point, I think I'll hand over to Jan Hendrik and let him explain. Now you can hear me. Thanks a lot, Dennis. Let me just. So we cannot see anything. Yeah, give me one second to readjust my screens. Okay, so. This is kind of tricky with three, with uh, three screens, but let's go. Yeah. So thanks again, Dennis. Um, I think this gives really the perfect motivation on, and you briefly talked about this, right? Why pins? I mean, everyone is, is, or many people consider pins now for very different domains, different equations. But I think that especially, or we think this, uh, the context of shell equations pose some very new and a bit different setting on how to apply these. And then it's basically has highlighted it, right? This finite element implementation, I would say, is really not the easiest. It's quite technical. I mean, you have to admit there has been quite some progress, right? There has, for example, been a very nice publication by Hale published four years ago, which gives you some nice Python framework to work with, where you can just also basically prescribe a chart. On, on, on the chart, you write all the measures and solve some shell equations. but. Still, I would say, yeah, if you want to extend this and uh, make this work for more complex settings, yeah, you require some, I would say, more advanced knowledge on the one end uh, in, in mathematics, right? In differential geometry, we've just seen that um, you do need an understanding of, of how these uh, stronger, stronger weak form is actually derived on this manifold, but also in terms of numerical methods, especially due to these um apparent limitations of standard function spaces in the finite element context you really need to find some ways to mitigate these locking issues in the thin thickness setting and then as mentioned there have been many ideas many improvements it's not like this is uh, unsolved but still i would say it's, it's not trivial and especially if you want to set up your own code yeah you, this is not something you do in a week but rather uh, i don't know maybe a month or so and maybe i also talk about intuition here, right? Why intuition? So even in what I would say, one of the state of the art implementations by Hale, um, for example, if you select this partial selected reduced integration to mitigate locking, you still have one uh, so-called splitting parameter alpha. You know it has to be bet between zero and one, but the exact value you kind of have to approximate or, or guess with some, some numerical estimates. And Hale provides a good job in giving us those, but still, um, that's not exactly something you want in a framework, right? Some unknown parameter, which you kind of have to figure out. So there are some really challenges of using these classical frameworks for this, this or in this context. Maybe let me just quote Hale at this point. So he himself says a fully general shell element with guaranteed uh, mathematical and numerical behavior in membrane and bending dominated regimes is still out of reach and mathematically robust finite element design for shells is an active research topic. And this really yeah, answers the question uh, why we consider pins. We're really interested in kind of 
getting some or in investigating how does this very nonlinear map that PINs basically possess due to this MLP architecture, is this able to handle some of these quite complex uh, settings where classical uh, unload functions in the finite element context really don't perform so well. Okay, so let's really jump in more into the technicalities. Um, yeah, I guess I don't have to explain how a pin works, but I thought I could highlight a bit what is maybe a bit special in this context, and um, I guess that's more interesting for you. So, of course, we do have some um, MLP, right, or pin, but what are here the in and outputs? The inputs, in this case, we define on the reference domain. So these are just, because this is essentially a 2D model, right, um, our two curvilinear coordinates that describe where we are, the output, well, must somehow be these five parameters that Dennis already mentioned. So these three translational degrees and two rotational degrees. We do, of course, have some freedom. Um, we can consider those in the local and the global frame. Typically, here it's easier to, at least for the translational degrees of freedom, consider those in the global frame because it's easier to evaluate. And typically, when you apply directly boundary conditions, these are naturally defined more in the global frame, right? And uh, yeah, you will see in a minute why this makes it easier. But we have to, of course, keep in mind that all the equations, then as mentioned, this are then given in the in the reference configuration. So we have to transform this flame, uh, this frame from the global, we have to transform our translation degrees of freedom from the global to the local frame. We can do this very conveniently, right? With this linear map, nothing special, just given by our uh, three uh, uh, vectors that describe this covariant frame. Um, but what we have to keep in mind later, and this is maybe it's not very difficult or it's kind of trivial, but this hints at some, uh, what I would say that these frameworks that give you access to, to gradients with this uh, automatic differentiation engine more easily are very much suited to these uh, non-Euclidean domains. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have to later differentiate um, these quantities in our local frame with respect to these um, curvilinear coordinates. And that means that we have to differentiate through this, this mapping right here. And of course, also these quantities depend on our curvilinear coordinates. And if we do this in the finite element setting, we have to, of course, always think of this. We have to apply product rule, manually write this out, while in any kind of convenient modern ML framework, you can simply apply autograd and, and don't worry about this. So this is from a, just a, a viewpoint of convenience much easier to work with. Then the angles are just directly given in the local frame. Um, what we do next is, I guess, nothing nothing fancy, where we just impose the clay boundary conditions by some unload function, so we don't have additional loss terms. Um, but I guess that's quite standard nowadays. And next we do then, of course, have to establish our strong or weak form. Here first the strong form that Dennis just showed you before, of course, here in the discrete setting. And well, what is interesting here is that, and this was also already briefly mentioned before, all these gradient operators are, of course, in our curvilinear frame. And this divergence operator, for example, has to consider these correction terms due to our varying local frame. So this is a bit more tricky. And what this means is that we need also these geometric correction terms at every collocation point that we look at, right? And these are essentially given by this by this chart, phi. Um, and just to briefly show you how this looks like, let's say we consider a hyperbolic paraboloid, so um, very standard shape. Um, we do consider certain sampling of collocation points. Here we sample just via standard Sobel sampling in the reference domain. And at every red dot here, you do need these geometric correction terms. And what we can very conveniently do, again, is in the hints at what I've mentioned before, having this autograph back and this automatic differentiation capabil capability, the user really only has to put in the chart and we can derive all of these um, quite easily. And we actually also had a finite element implementation and we spent at least a couple of days uh, once to figure out which term of the Christoffel symbol wasn't really correct. So yeah, just as a, a side note, but this is really much more convenient. And what we can do, all these green, all these green terms right here can be pre-computed, right? They stay constant for a certain collocation point. So if we don't change the position of the collocation points, 
this won't change and just add this during training then to the to the um, appropriate terms to for example evaluate the surface covering derivative appropriately and here this is then actually what classically you get out of the the pin or in this case this is a pin prediction and this would be just the classical derivative of the pin output with respect to the input okay can I ask a, yeah, just a clarifying question? So is your intention just to use this as a forward solver or are you aiming to do inverse problems and like learn a considerative relation that could go into a final? I mean, yeah, mode? of course it's with print, you always, it's a natural question to ask, right? And to at some point consider inverse problems. Right now we're focusing on the forward problem. We're looking into how to use this for, for inverse problems. There are a lot of interesting things you can do, right? Finding optimal surface, finding the optimal thickness distribution. But from based on this work in this talk, it's more about the forward problem and also some insights on how these yeah, methods perform in, in settings where classical finite elements is or has its difficulties, let's say. So can, can you comment on, so by working in the strong form and not the variational form, you lose the pullback in, in the nice Jacobian way of pulling back onto the tangent plane. Can, can you comment on those choices that you've made? It, it seems like you're putting it all on automatic differentiation to handle that. Yeah. Is that right? I mean, here we do consider this in the reference domain and that's why we have to get these correction terms. But I mean, this is not a tricky thing to do, right? Um, we can very conveniently just have to implement this once right, but then you really just have to enter the chart and that's basically it. So there's really not no challenge actually in, in considering it on this on this manifold. That's what you mean. Yeah, I got yeah, I'm just curious if you view so you could still mm -hmm. put this into a variational method at the end if you were to learn like whatever closure you might attempt to learn. Yeah, maybe let's just advance and okay. maybe some of the questions will actually get answered along the way, but if not, then let's maybe we have some time at the end. But thanks. Um, okay, so yeah, let's get back. Um, yeah, and we can of course consider the strong or the weak form, the variational form, um, keeping in mind now that we pre-compute these geometric measures, and then once we set this up, we can very conveniently build this up. Um, and yeah, before I get into results, let me just briefly, because I think it's also interesting for later give you some details on the actual numerical implementation. So for everything that I'm gonna show you, we really consider a small or comparably small uh, multi-layer perce perception, I would say, just three in layer 50 neurons. Uh, GLU activation, just based on empirical findings, uh, was shown to work best. And a second order optimizer, just to but keep in mind, basically the architecture of this MLP, MLP is kept constant. Okay, um, so what have we considered? Uh, we have considered three, I would say, quite popular benchmarks, uh, three very diverse shapes or, or shell structures. First of all, we have this partly clamped hyperbolic paraboloid that I've already shown you, just basically clamped in all five fields on one side, subject to gravity loading. Next, we have this fully clamped hemisphere, um, not subject to gravity loading, but just a, a point load. And lastly, this, and those that are a bit more familiar among the audience with, with uh, shell frameworks probably have heard of this Cordelis low roof benchmark. This is a very popular benchmark to test your, your in-house finite element code, let's say, against locking, because you have some very, you have basically have pure membrane and pure bending states. And this is, uh, in, at least in the thin thickness limit, not easy to or a class, classical finite element without the appropriate measures that we've heard of before would fail to, to basically converge to the, the right solution. And this is again a subject to gravity loading clamped on both sides um, on the curved edges. Okay, so here are the results. Starting as mentioned with a partly clamped hyperbolic paraboloid, we have here characteristic thickness of 10%, right? We normalize it just by the length of this thing around 2000 collocation points and already here it's quite uh, yeah obvious what happens so the strong form indeed has a lot of troubles to make any progress we did not really observe any convergence in this setting considering the strong form while the weak form yeah i mean you see the results um looks quite quite good of course i mean 
It's interesting, right? The strong form takes actually much longer, I would say around 10 times uh, longer than the weak form, just because you have this additional derivative, right, due to the divergence in there. But still, even if you, you know, let those train for the same number of epochs, you will not get any convergence with the strong form, at least that's what we've seen. Before I talk more about this, just here again, the solution fields, um, we've tried to kind of present in, in, in one picture all five fields of the pin using the weak form. You also see here this, this different samplings, where there's this traditional mesh in, in FEM. And you see, so the color basically highlights the, the sum of absolute values of these two rotational fields. And then you see that it overall just bulges down as you would expect. So the actual numbers, um, of course, are in the paper that I can redirect you later, but just um, you can see that this is quite a good approximate. Let's briefly talk about why the weak form is superior and this just confirms some of the findings that, for example, Lee, um, among others, have, have published last year. Um, on the one hand, you have more or higher order derivatives, right, which um, cause some trouble. What we found, or what, yeah, based on what we found out, it's quite likely that it's really due to this just sheer number of residual terms you have in the strong form. Because you do have all these additional normal boundary conditions, right, which you have to um, additionally set up, which are just naturally embodied in the weak form. And so natural thing to try out is just a fully clamped uh, hyperbolic paraboloid, right? You don't have any of those terms. Um, maybe skip, off, well, skip that. But here you see the fully clamped hyperbolic paraboloid uh, convergence in terms of the average relative L2 error. And the strong form here also at least starts to converge. If you compare this to the partly clamped one, right, you don't see any progress but um, still drastically outperformed by the weak form. And again, this is by epoch, not by computational time, which would even draw a more uh, or an even clearer picture. If you look at the actual physical output of this to get- Yeah, yeah and I have a question. A hundred yeah? epochs, is, uh, which is actually, since you are doing LBFGS, you don't have uh, mm -hmm. many, but so it's actually iteration. A hundred mm -hmm. iterations is not a lot. Yeah, it's actually quite quite um, fast. And for the weak form, it's maybe four seconds, two seconds per epoch. So if you have a very, let's say, a sufficiently fine FEN mesh, it's quite comparable in terms of the runtime, at least in this setting. So it's quite good news. Um, but yeah. I mean, also, I'm surprised that you use LBFGS from the beginning. Mm -hmm. So far, you basically, with those two, you're telling me this is not a very difficult problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wait, wait till the end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we tried, what I show here is the product of many iterations. So we tried first order optimizers. Uh, long story short, I think they don't, what we observed here, they don't make much difference. Adam would, of course, is much faster per epoch, but takes more epochs. I think in computational effort, um, that's not a huge difference, but yeah, that's what just our observations were. So in terms of the visual output, you see here, the strong form now gets closer, right? But it's still outperformed by the weak form, likely due to the number of, of um, residual terms. So let's move on to the second example, just to get some intuition on how this method works on really diverse charts and different curvatures, right? We have here the fully clamped hemisphere, characteristic thickness of 5%, uh, with more collocation points. And this is now an elliptical geometry, so quite different. And now we only consider the weak form, right? It's much, performs much better. So um, that's what we stuck with. And yeah, you see just visually again, quite good match in, in terms of all five solution fields. As a side note, what we also did, I, I, I kind of lied to you. It's not a point load we apply, but actually a Gaussian kernel, because if you apply point load, really this gives really rise to, to strain and stress singularities at point of application. And the concept of a point load is more coming from a mesh-based method, right, where you really apply this on a, on a certain node. While in the pin setting, I would say it's, uh, yeah, I mean, you would probably define a collocation point, right, uh, apply this point load exactly on that point, but it's very unstable. And if you look at reality, right, a point load is also not something that's, uh, yeah, this is basically the, um, depicts the reality. You typically have some kind of smooth and out version. So that's why we you choose a Gaussian kernel and with that, it's much more comparable and also more stable, both for finite elements and the, the pin. Sorry, can you, I, I think I may have missed this. Can you define mm -hmm. how you're actually discretizing the weak form? Like, are you doing quadrature? 
so on. So we just, this is just standard Sobol sampling. I mean for the pin. Uh, so you're doing like a Monte Carlo integration of the weak form, is that right? We just classically yeah, sample by a Sobol sampling, sum over it up and then average this, just a classical approximation. I see, okay, okay, thanks. Okay, so again here in the reference domain, just to convince you more. Now in terms of the U1 displacement field, it looks all quite promising. I think the, the story I'm trying to make here, and now I've, here I show three different charts, right? But we've actually tried a lot more. These are just the ones we focus on the end. We've seen very robust prediction, predictional capabilities for, for very different charts. So that's really the, the good news at this point. And just as a side note here as well, so typically you take the finite element solution as the ground truth, right? And you wonder if, if it doesn't work out and um, where did your pin go wrong? But what we observed in, in some cases here, for example, for this fully clamped hemisphere at the boundary, no matter how much you refine the mesh, um, you will get these mesh artifacts in, in some of the displacement fields. This is now for theta one. And the pin here does not have those, but for for the Phoenix solution, so the finite element framework we used, we couldn't really get rid of this effect. You probably can if you consider a more homogeneous mesh, but again, Phoenix doesn't have this functionality and this just adds a bit up to some of the, the technical intricacies that I, I mentioned before, right? Um, so, yeah. Okay, then let's maybe talk about um, one of the most inter interesting setups. So this is this Scordillus low roof benchmark that I've mentioned before which is this, this benchmark for shell elements to test against locking. And here we really have a very thin shell, only 0.5% characteristic thickness, um, yeah, around 65,000 collocation points. And well, I've shown you the results already. This I think is very nice because you see the Phoenix and the, the FEM solution and pin again matches very accurately. And well, again, on the FEM side, you really need to think about how can we um basically improve these shape functions uh to be able to to yeah predict or to to yeah uh, simulate the actual physical response while for the pin architecture i mentioned this in the beginning we really only fix this on three layers 50 neurons each and this is quite promising right so there is indeed um it seems like this non-linearity that the pin possesses is able to um, approximate the solution field in domains where classical methods really have their issues. So that's really the, the good news at this point. But of course, um, before I go into get into the bad news, um, that's what you typically do is right. You have some reference value, which has been around for uh, almost 40 years and is shown to really be converged. And then you compare your finite element framework against this value. We see, okay, the pin is a bit more off, but it's also, of course, a, ma a matter of how, you, how long you train this and so on. But we do see that, um, yeah, it really gets very close to the, the physical solution, which is great news. And again, here, just for completeness in the reference domain, the U3 displacement in the, in the global frame. Okay, but now I, I mentioned it before, there's, of course, a, a bad side to this as well, and that's where we're currently struggling a bit. So what we do observe is that so I've, I've only shown you the results, right? But I haven't shown you really how, how we got there. And what I mean by that is that the training time, as some of you might have uh, already suspected, is just directly negatively correlated with this characteristic thickness. So here you just we just ran the same simulation, the same Scott Ellis low roof benchmark for different characteristic thicknesses starting from one, which is of course not physical, but you can still solve the equations. This works very fast, right? I mean, you see here, it's not even it's maybe something like 20 something epochs. Um, but of course, the smaller you go, the lower you go, the longer the training takes. So why is that? And then it's already mentioned this, right? And I guess it comes uh, maybe not too, too, too much surprise. The weak form that we consider, but of course it's also in, in the strong form in, in, in some way, has this, in this case, three different strain terms, membrane bending and shear strains, which do scale differently with the thickness. So the membrane and shear strains scale linearly, the bending strains uh, scale with a uh, power of three. And this is of course an issue because in the thin thickness limit, you just, let's say for randomly initialized network, 
you do get um, yeah, quite inflated or quite different magnitudes in terms of these different loss contributions. Right? You can also think of this as one, one loss function that has three different residual terms in some sense. And I mean, this, you probably know this better than I do, but there is a lot of literature and also a lot of progress on how to mitigate this, um, what follows basically from this unbalanced losses, right? Pathological gradients, stiff gradients, um, and resolve this. One issue with all or, or many of these approaches is that they more or less try to rescale those terms, right? Um, and therefore mitigate this, this imbalance. But here we cannot really do this, right? This is the actual physical truth. We cannot just rescale the, the, the membrane or the, the shear uh, strains accordingly. This would change the actual physics. And so this is a bit the, the open problem at this point. We cannot apply these methods. We have investigated and, and looked into quite a few of, of ideas. One is, of course, to find some anneal variant of this. So you, in a simple setting, you just start with t equal to one and then you slowly reduce it. But I wouldn't, in some cases, it might improve it a bit, but it's not that I would say this now solves this problem. Actually, this is also um, found under the name of curriculum regularization, which I've seen later. I was quite excited when I read that. But apparently for, for the problem, the, these authors consider it work better than in, in this setting. We've considered adaptive activation functions, right? They also try to solve um, some issues of the spectral bias, but, and, and they don't need to rescale the terms. They really just act on the activation functions. Um, but also here, we did not really see any major uh, progress in terms of the convergence, right? We tried adaptive sampling might argue, okay, in the thin thickness limit, maybe there are very localized membrane and bending strains. There are. So maybe you need more points at these sharp interfaces, right? But while this is the case, these sharp interfaces do exist. This also doesn't really solve the problem. So at this point, it's really, and that's why I'm also particularly excited to be here to um, maybe get some input also from you. So at this point, it's more, I would also say, a very interesting benchmark and opportunity to really understand pins and, and the performance of pins in this very interesting setting. And we've basically seen, right, there is a combination of parameters in this very simple MLP that can handle even very thin thicknesses. It's really just a question of how to, to train them um, appropriately, right? So this is Jan, did you did you say something about? Uh, I see you you cite Amaya's paper on adaptive activation function. Do you actually mm -hmm. use and what what version of adaptive activation function? Because when I saw the mm -hmm. the plateau that you said immediately, I said okay, the, suffering from the uh, a bad minimum, and you can avoid bad minima using adaptive mm -hmm. activation functions. We have mm -hmm. theorem for that. So I think this is based on the official Git upload, based on maybe. Um, was it maybe one, 1.2 years ago. So I'm also admitting that it's also where we finished this work, right? And uh, been a while since we looked into it. So I'm very really curious if there are new approaches that could solve this problem, right? Um, but yeah, it's around maybe one year ago, the status of one year ago. The, are you familiar with the Rowdy activation function? I've heard of it, yeah. Yeah, okay, maybe I may I would comment later. Yeah, that would be great if you, maybe I, I think I only have one more slide and then we can open discussions. But um, yeah, so let me just close this by saying the good news are really right. Pins can solve these shell equations in their weak form, at least not in their strong form. Um, and it seems really pins do possess this sufficiently rich function space to handle yeah, quite challenging solution fields where classical methods really need some some additional tuning to, to make this work. But it's, and it's not, so this is quite a fundamentally different issue than, than these classical methods have. Um, the issue with pins is right, is, is, is often is the case that, well, you need to, to find this, the weights and biases and getting there is the hard part. On another note, also the good news is, right, all these different shards really do not seem to pose any problem. So on non-Euclidean domains, it seemed to work quite well. And as I mentioned before, and hinted many times, the implementation is just much simpler than, than kind of, I mean, you always say this, I guess, about pins, but here I would say this is um, even more so the case due to the many reasons I mentioned. Okay, with that, um, yeah, let me come to an end. I hope we have some room for discussion. Thank you very much for the invitation. 
your interest and yeah, looking forward to your input. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jan and Dennis. Amelia, do you want to comment on? Uh, 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 before, before, sorry, sorry. Before I, I before I forget, because uh, the um, that behavior that you show Jan with the with the thickness, it's very similar to what um, people have observed by using like the let's say the advection equation, and mm -hmm. they change the velocity. Uh, they change the velocity, and they show that at some velocity you basically you lose it. Mm -hmm. So what they did is like a continuation method. So so instead of from starting, let's say from for t equals um, 0.01, instead of you you just uh, gradually mm -hmm. you change from t equals one to you, although you're targeting the very very small, you, mm -hmm. you sort of gradually and gracefully do that. And there's a paper, uh, I think mm -hmm. Mike Kirby, my former student, and a Berkeley guy. Uh, uh, is, uh, they, they have a paper and, and they present it here, but it's like a continuation method. And and basically the landscape, I think if you are able to visualize, it would be interesting to see if, you, mm -hmm. if you're able to visualize mm -hmm. the landscape I th from, from the- Definitely, yeah. From the plateau, I can tell, you know, uh, that, that you get um, these subtle points. So mm -hmm. that, that, that gives the, uh, but if you go close enough, you will, you will avoid that. And I think, um, it's interesting, you know, because I, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in things that don't work. I'm not interested in things that work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I, I like that curve. That, uh, if it converts so fast, then it's so boring. But, but, <laughs> but yeah, continuation. Try, try the continuation. I, I, it reminds me very much of that. And then maybe Amelia, you can comment about the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the various uh, active, adaptive activation functions. It has now three generations of those. Uh, hi, Jen. Uh, hi. Basically, uh, I shared the link with you and uh, Dennis uh, about the Rowdy mm. activation function. So we, we uh, basically proposed three uh, activation functions. So the one which you are using is, I think, it's a global one. And later on, we mm -hmm. proposed the uh, local locally adaptive activation functions. And, and this is the third one. So so if you have, you know, uh, we, we can discuss this later if you have any doubts or you mm -hmm. know, any, any, any problem with this. I can I can explain that. Oh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I'll I'll look into that. I mean, maybe to just briefly also just George's comment. So I've tried out to gradually decrease the yeah. thickness, right? This is what I, I meant by this curriculum training, which uh, other people have also tried out. Right. First time I tried it, it uh, did to to work better, but then uh, investigating this for for different charts and so on, really, yeah, was not really a, uh, really a clear tendency. So so this. I've also thought that this should work and should improve this, but yeah, it didn't really help. If um, it starts like that, uh, yeah, and if it starts like this, you see from the beginning, the smallest uh, mm -hmm. thickness, right, goes to a plateau. So you lock in. It's clearly a subtle point. So I think the uh, rowdy activation function, we actually have a, a mm -hmm. theorem that says that if you uh, if you use uh, this adaptive activation functions with the rowdy, you will never get to a bad minimum. Doesn't mean that you will get a, a to a, a global minimum, but you're not going to get to a bad minimum. And by bad minimum it means the subtle points that give you this saturation from the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Now, I've, I've actually read the paper. It's very interesting. I'll, I haven't looked into it yet. Um, I've tried out, as I mentioned, these adaptive activation functions, but I might have to like because it was based right on one of the early versions, and maybe there has been some. Uh, in the first one, then. in the first problem you show with the boundary conditions, I agree with you. You also, um, I think, some data is using also variational forms for uh, crack propagation that she did. Um, mm -hmm. But on the on the boundary conditions, we use the uh, self-adaptive weights. You know the paper by uh, yeah 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 from Texas A&M. So that 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 seems to for us in a lot of cases it's mm. uh, been very very helpful. We have, that's our default actually. It's not so the of, of one. Yeah. My, my, yeah. my former student Paris Perdicaris. It's not. Yeah. It's, a, it's a Texas A and M paper that we implemented. Yeah, yeah. So uh, would you say this works better than just using some other function? That it, it works really well. Yeah, it works really well because it it, uh, it turns out that these weights that you find on the fly as a function mm -hmm. of space time, uh, they actually reflect uh, a temporal and spatial scales. Uh, okay. They're basically wave numbers, and mm -hmm. and you sort of find the. The, the characteristic wave number of the mode of, of a of a natural mode of the uh, structure, for example, here. Uh, yeah. 
says the same thing in, in fluids and so on. But uh, yeah, we found that there's a there's a physical meaning behind it. But yeah, as you but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the other thing you could try is uh, maybe try Adam in the beginning for these cases. Yeah, I actually tried that out, but also no. And it does work. No much improvement. No. Okay. Um, you, because... you know, one thing, Den Dennis, you made a comment early on about mixed form for yeah. the um, the T T cubed term. Is that applicable here? Like, can you break it into two different loss functions for the stiff and the not stiff parts? Oh, that's a good question. Because then you could have a different. You know, two different atoms, one for each, but both with a different momentum and, and so on. Yeah, I guess technically you could do something similar, right? Because it's, it's the same strong weak form is being used, but then you split it up. Oh. Yeah. So do, do I get this right? You partly consider the strong and the weak form as loss and trains on yeah. both, or what's the idea? Yeah, we had, we had a talk uh, here recently by Exxon. I don't know if he's uh, dialing in today. Uh, from MIT, who um, works with um, mm -hmm. uh, what's the name of the guy, Johannes, I think. Uh, but he 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 showed that uh, splitting, like the stress split formulation, mm -hmm. uh, worked as opposed to a, a monolithic simulation uh, formulation that didn't work. So so he he split the fields and then he had basically a sequential from one to the other. We also have some local expertise here. We see that uh, using split splitting schemes. Uh, works well for these stiff problems when you have stiff problems. Could, could you repeat the name, sir? Then I can. Uh, uh, Simin, do you do you remember the name, the last name of Exan? Uh, hi. Uh, yes. Uh, last name was uh, Hakikat, I think. And can you put it on the chat? Can you put his yes, one? Yes. Sure. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Umer. 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 We have people from all over. Umer is joining us from uh, from Saudi Arabia. Oh, wow. yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but thanks again thanks for, for the hint. I mean, yeah, I think that's interesting. We could could try to adapt the FE tricks here in the setting as well. It's true. The, the split of operator seems to work. I mean, he, this uh, guy Hassan uh, has a series of papers, and he convinced us here that uh, actually split formulations work well for exactly for that uh, imbalance of the terms that you mentioned, Jan. Okay. Yeah. You can you can think about it in terms of the condition number, right? Like this is a very large condition number problem, right? And the idea that you could just attack it with a single learning rate, of course you can't, right? You, you need two different learning rates mm -hmm. for yeah. to target the two different pieces. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, any other questions for Dennis or Jan? <laughs> Uh, I have a question. Is the is the code uh, on the GitHub? Because we uh, actually some data is is working on um, monitoring different structures uh, using uh, some methods that we developed, and we did the beam, and then the um, editor uh, reject our paper because they said they, they want us to do a, a shell also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good timing. Yeah. yeah. So currently yeah. no, but if you would ask me in, in three days, then yes. <laughs> so I'm, yeah. I'm uploading it in the next days. Oh, so, so it would be available? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay. The paper on this is actually at the final revision stage. We submitted the revision today, so I expect it to be published soon, and we will we have included the link anyway. So again, I think it's cleaning up the code right now. Okay, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, so I'm happy to share with you. Yeah, some data or Henry, do you guys have any questions? These are the uh, mechanics in the group. Some data? So I think some data is having another meeting. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Um all right. Uh thanks very much. As I said, we have uh, we call I call them pinheads from all over the world. We have Brazil and Turkey and uh, everyone uh, is attending every week. So so uh, all the people who are associated with this uh understand what you're saying uh, but yeah. thanks for the first part uh, Dennis so people would um, uh, appreciate the difficulties actually of the of the shell structures uh, and the formulation still uh, the um, the high order methods don't don't help for the locking because I I work on lock locking before for this type of but not for shell but I know that higher the uh, higher like spectral elements for example we use the or HP finite elements they they um, free yeah. you 
with the right. So this, this task work is also, uh, uh, you know, as a geometric implementations and whatnot, there, there are other methods how people try to solve this, but these are, are each of them comes with tricks, you know, bells and whistles. And it's, it's um, none of those is available readily for all kinds of, 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 of complex scenarios. So I would say, of course, people have, have played with those as well, but especially for this non-Euclidean context where you have to deal with curved manifolds and so forth, this can get very tricky. And it's not, not readily available in any of the commercial code. And uh, uh, not, not Trask from Sandia that he, he spoke a couple of times. I don't know if he signed off because uh, he's a busy man. He also has a formulation on, um, on manifolds, solving PDEs on manifolds. Oh, nice. So, so okay. he just texted me during your talk. And he wants he wants to um, reach out, reach out to you, I think. So, so oh, that's great. Right. Yeah, of course. He has, he has developed a higher order method on stencils uh, uh, on solving PDs on manifolds. Oh, okay, that'll be interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks very much. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, Thank you. So Zogren, you have to introduce yourself now, like being the speaker <laughs> and the presenter. You, have, you get the double salary today. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before we move to that second talk, do we have any questions for our speakers? Okay. Thank you. So now we move to our second talk. I'm going to um, give the second talk. It's a, it's a, it's a really brief and entry level introduction of uh, uh, deep learning tools, deep learning library named Neural Network Intelligence from Microsoft. And uh, this talk is, is going to be a short one. And it's, uh, like I said, it's uh, entry level, it's an introduction. Uh, it's a kind of a tutorial. So yeah. And so the mm, this library is, of course, it's Python library, but deep learning. It's also a tool for automatic or automated machine learning uh, automatically. So and, and the library focuses on uh, four main aspects. The hyperparameter tuning, hyperparameter tuning optimization, HPO, the neural architecture search, NAS, the model compression, and the future engineering. And currently, it supports many uh, other Python libraries for deep learning, and in, such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, SKLearn, and, and etc. But it doesn't, does not support JAX yet. And <clears throat> this is a screenshot from the uh, homepage of the library NI. So, as you can see, on, on the on, uh, left column, there are many algorithms of hyperparameter tuning and random optimization. And also, the library also supports many ag uh, neural network search algorithms and, of course, model compression. And I think this library recently supports, you know, the support for the feature engineering part is released recently. And so, uh, in this talk, in this tutorial, the introduction to uh, the library, I'm going to focus on. Uh, two main parts the HP, HPO that parameter of condition and the new search and for the HPO uh, there are many built-in they call it tuners but algorithms for finding the best hyperparameters for training new network machine learning and here I list some of them uh, I think um, some algorithms like random search research everyone has heard of them also a hyperband for tuning finding uh, hyperparameters you know giving that some you know where we have limited computational resource and uh the the overall procedure of hpo hyperparameter optimization uh is could be decomposed in this way so first we define the search space or tuning space what parameters we want to search we want to find and then uh we need to keep them a prior description or, or you know candidates for those hyperparameters and also uh of course we need to write our own executable program for a single experiment with specific hyperparameter settings. And, and then we need to define metrics. So what's make, you know, how good is the hyperparameter set of hyperparameters? And how do we evaluate uh, this set of hyperparameters? And finally, we need to choose a HPO algorithm to tune to find uh, the good uh, hyperparameters based on the metric we define. define. And so, so for for the level for this neural neural network intelligence NI library, uh, the main function of this whole HPO pro procedure should be written. And they recommend writing coding in this way. And like I was saying, we first need to define search space. So here I show for neural network, uh, we search for weight, depth, and activation activation functions. So the uh, activation function and width are universal. So for each layer, each trailing layer, they have the same 
width and the same activations. And of course, you need to you know pre-code your own um, you know experiment file, and you need to choose <clears throat> the tuner, the HPO, the HPO algorithm, and of course you need to choose the you know you need to specify the hyperparameters for the tuner for hyperparameters. Uh, for this case, just to, to, you need to tell uh, the algorithm you know you want to maximize maximize the, the metric or minimize metric. And of course, here uh, this A zero A zero is uh, is for a web portal where we can monitor the whole HBO pro procedure. It's kind of, it's a nice feature of this library. I'll just, I'll explain this later. And for so this is for the main function of HBO. And inside the, this run sorry run model uh, file oops. sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, in the, inside of this, you know, your, your experiment file, um, there there's some other stuff you need to do to to make your code compatible with this library. Uh, first, before you build the model, before you build a new network, you, you need to use this their interface to retrieve or to obtain the hyperparameters from from the uh, the, the environment. Uh, and they recommend doing it in this way. And then, of course, you build your neural network using this obtained hyperparameters. You perform training, and after the training is done, you need to compute the metric and you know fit the metric to uh, the environment through their interface. So here, NI is the, num the name of the library, and you report the final result, uh, meaning that you tell the tuner, the hyperparameter algorithm, the uh, the metric for this single trial, a uh, single experiment. So here I uh, used this, you know, I, I did a very simple example, uh, function for function regression is uh, we want to regress this one dimension input, one dimensional output function uh, with very high frequency. And this is pretty example, a simple task, easy task. And the third space, uh, the tuning, the, yeah, the tuning space, the, the candidates for those hyperparameters uh, yeah, we're, we're finding the two type parameter for depth, width, and active function, like I was saying before. And the metric for this for this example is the minimum of the training loss with a fixed number of total iterations. I know people, you know, this is not re very reasonable metrics. People tend to use validation loss or validation error to to avoid overfitting, and this could be easily attended uh, to to such cases. And for for functional for people who are interested in pin and functional approximation. Uh, we, I think most of us know that, uh, you know, the results are pretty sensitive to the random initialization of the neural network with some bias. So some people suggested, uh, you know, doing multiple experiment training of the neural networks and tend to you know, take the average for the results. So, but of course, depends on how you define your metric. And here I use the simplest, uh, which may lead to repeating, but like I was saying, this is, Introduction tutorial to the library. You can change it, uh, whatever you want. And uh, the search algorithm uh, I chose here for the example is the tree structure person estimator. I have no idea what this algorithm is. It's recommended by this library, and uh, it's a classic Bayesian optimization algorithm. And I used it with the default configuration because this, you know, the library, the NI library, recommends in this way. And <clears throat> okay, so for the you know, width and depth activation function, the, the candidates for the, their discrete uh, values or discrete variables. And of course you can make the hyperparameter you wish to tune uh, continuous, uh, such as on the on the right. And the learning rate has the, uh, so for, for example, for learning rate or the momentum uh, coefficient in, inside the atom of measure, uh, they, they, are, they are continuous. They are, could be set could be set in this way so uh, we give them you can give them the your private solution or the search uh, you know search space of the uh, those continuous variables and uh, okay so if you're using command line to to run your python file after you're typing this python man here i use hbo uh, in the terminal line, in, the, in the command line uh, you have access to multiple links to a web portal where we can monitor the process via HPO and also the results. And I, I, this, I think the package on oh no, the library is still in, uh, in being developed and 
there's some 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 compatibility issues uh for most you know um, you know they, they provide multiple several links and i most of the time only one of them is working so but but most of the time at least one of them is working so you need to uh, copy and paste and put it into your web browser and this is the web portal looks like uh, and <clears throat> So you can uh, you can see here is the number of trial numbers, and for the searching hyperparameter tuning process, you can set a, give a, you can give a cap for the total uh, duration for for the for the entire HPO procedure. You know, we want to search on tune the parameter for for twenty hours, and you can set it here. And also, um, you need to, you know we need to. Uh, Specify the the max number of uh, trials because this is for simply HPO uh, hyperparameter tuning. So you need to specify the max number of trials uh, this procedure takes. And and then yeah, this is a very nice feature for people for users to monitor the whole process. And on the right, you can see all those trials and all those trials that has been succeeded or running. Uh, and always running and uh, you also you can you can check the the metric and also the architecture it's used to to generate to run this experiment and yeah so here i can open this trial and you can see that, you know, for this trial uh the width is x60 the depth is three and the aggregation type is hyper and uh okay so after for this exa example after the 200 trials are complete, no surprise, the uh, the, the largest neural network with ReLU active function is found to be the most, you know, in, uh, to, to be the best in terms of the metric we define. And yeah, so this is how, how it works, how, you know, uh, entry-level users <laughs> use it in an entry-level way. And okay, so now we move to hyperparameter using the library, this lab library to do hyperparameter tuning for, for pins. So in this example, uh, I'm solving the uh, 1D Burks equations in a forward problem manner, meaning, meaning that we're solving the equations. Uh, everything about the equation is known. And I'm using the example from the DeepSD Deep library. Uh, from the, you can, you know, in this example, it can be accessed in this uh, GitHub homepage. And this is the, uh, the equations. And, and the search way, again, is the depth width and aggregation of the neural network. And the metric here, I changed the metric to be the mean of the absolute value of the residue points on on the test collocation points instead of training. So we use for the residue for, for you know where we want the equation to be satisfied. Uh, we after the training is complete, we use an entire new uh, set of collocation points and we uh, measure the the residue uh, on those points and we take the mean of the absolute is the absolute value and make it. A metric of course we want we want this metric to be as small as possible and again the search algorithm it, it could you know uh, the, the the search algorithm does not have to be this tp this tray based estimator it can be anything uh, native supported by the library but for uh this tutorial i'm using tp and so this is a screenshot from uh, uh from the model file, this progress equation, the, the Python file we use to run this progress equation using ping. And this is basically the same as the one from the DPSD library. And of course, uh, here I imported the, the library and I, and I set the hyperparameters in this way. And uh, I use those hyper, uh, specific, pre, uh, okay, specified hyperparameters to build the neural network. And after the training is complete, I use this uh, again this library to report the final metric, and yeah, this is just a few lines of code different from the original file. And in the in the main HPO Python file, uh, so that can, uh, you know, so the, those how this this is the search space, and again the 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 command we use to uh, run this Burgess equation pit uh, is Python Burgess py because the, this is the name of the file and yeah this is pretty similar as to, uh, to the previous example and here it is uh, how it looks so because you know <laughs> training a pin for both equation is much more complicated than, than training a regular network for functional approximation without any 
uh, derivatives uh, inside the loss function. And so I set the max number of trials to be 50. And even though you know, the number of, the number of trials, the, the max number of trials is lower than before, it still takes uh, four hours and a half to finish the whole experience. And uh, so you can see this, this procedure is very similar to all the other of the previous case. And eventually, the uh, because I'm using a, uh, you know, I, uh, okay. So so this is the results. So I, I picked the top three uh, based on the the metric I define, and so all three share the same active functions, which is no surprise. Cut one tangent uh, is preferred by this uh, birth equation uh, using pain, and and I I I try so. Uh, I use this uh, the best hyperparameters uh, searched by this algorithm and, and this procedure and, and retrain it to uh, obtain the, uh, the actually the, the, the real relative error out of the error based on 10 trials. Uh, so so it's uh, for, 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 for this case, uh, the metric during the training or searching for the hyperparameters, uh, it's uh, necessary to assume that we have no access to the exact solution to the PDE because if we do, then there's no point of you know finding the solution using neural networks. But after we find uh, the best architecture or the best hyperparameter, we we can and we retrain it and we compare with the exact solution or the reference solution and to 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 you know to see if we get good estimate. Uh, <clears throat> So, so this is a, uh, the results. Uh, and okay, okay. So that's that's HPO on pin. That's neural network intelli intelligence library for HPO on pin. And there are many others have a primary waiting to be tuned for a lot of machine learning pro uh, problems. For neural networks, we need to find the the architectural neural networks. But besides that, we also there are also other hyper primary. For for instance, for this uh, Bayesian pins. A problem we're solving now. I'm solving this 1D study diffusion reaction equation uh, in four problem manner, and because it's I'm using Bayesian neural networks, uh, is a, which is very different from the regular neural networks. And uh, for Bayesian for Bayesian neural networks, the one of the most common ways. So instead of the point-wise estimate, we do distribution estimate, and, and one of the most commonly used uh, methods. To methods to estimate diffusion is by is MCMC. So we sample against this uh, posterior distribution and we obtain the samples and to use them to estimate uh, the accuracy to make prediction to do UQ to 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 obtain uncertainty. And and so Zogren here you, the architect you fix the architecture. Yes, I fix the architecture. Only only tune the HMC hyperparameters. So, so you use yeah. like what three layers and. Uh... 50 a unit, what did you do here for what you do for this? I think it's two hidden layers, 50 neurons on each layer. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, so for this example, I want to show that you know this HPO procedure can be very flexible. Uh, it depends on you know what type of hyperparameter you want to tune. And for HMC, for people, for those who are not familiar with HMC, HMC, HMC is an MCMC sampler, MCMC algorithm, and uh, simulates the Hamiltonian dynamics and and also do and also it also does the uh, metropolis testing after to reject or set accept the proposed sample and there are two key uh, hyperparameters inside of the HMC because MG, HMC utilizes uh, the leapfrog scheme to simulate the Hamiltonian dynamics so for inside inside of the leapfrog scheme uh, you know we need to choose the step size for the leapfrog scheme and also the number of steps. So those two those two hyperparameters are very important to obtain good uh, results from using HMC. So and there's some references uh, saying that the, the ideal acceptance rate of the HMC is 62 percent. So here in this case, I'm only, I only tune those two hyperparameters, parameter, and my goal is to achieve you know 60 percent acceptance rate, uh, which is ideal for HMC. Uh, of course, number of burning samples and the number of posterior samples and also other such as random seed, they are all uh, preset and fixed during the whole procedures. And uh, yeah, so in this case, the epsilon is the step size, so the L is the number of uh, uh, you know, steps. And they are, they are uh, 
uh, for for epsilon for the step set, it is continuous for the uh, uh, number of step sets. Uh, I'm sorry, number of steps uh, is dis is discrete, but we can make it continuous, and then we do rounding. Uh, yeah, and and it, it can also this in you know, this example, I'm not showing I'm not showing any results of these examples, but uh, as you can see, the the, the best uh, hyperparameter, the best set of hyperparameters is found uh, achieve actually exactly 60% uh, accepted rate of efficiency. And I use this exact pair of hyperparameters and I rerun the experiment. And again, of course, I obtain a 60% uh, accepted rate for efficiency, and the, the, the results are looking, are looking good. And then in, uh, what I want to show from this example is the flexibility of HBO. It's not the lab supports this, and but you know, the more important thing is we don't for HPO for neural network or HPO in machine learning we don't have to always focus on the architecture of the neural network also uh, tune other uh, hyperparameters using the same algorithms. Okay, okay, so this is a short uh, summarize uh, some summary over these uh, HPO, HPO functionality the elaborate the neural network intelligent net, uh, elaborate is of very high com compatibility. It can, it can work with any codes you write, as long as it, it's the, the reading uh, in Python. And for this case, for this functionality of the, this library, of course, you can use X, you can use a NumPy, you can use TensorFlow, you can use PyTorch, it depends. So it can, it, it works with any uh, code you have. And of course, the library supports many HPO algorithms and and, and you need, for for the previous three examples, I only show uh, TPE, the tray-based uh, estimator, but it has many and many more. And I think this part of the of the library of the library is very helpful for us to to do easy tuning and, and to achieve better performance. Okay, now we move to next uh, the second part of this uh, tutorial, and in this part, I want to focus on new active search. Uh, which is support, supported by this library. And of course, to do neural search, we still need to specify the search space. And, and there are many, uh, and they provide useful tools and, and interfaces. Zolke, yes. Zolke, can I ask a question on the previous one? Uh, just uh, uh, because I could see from uh, to going to pins, you didn't have to change anything, but uh, how do I do deep net where I have two neural networks? It's pretty straightforward. You just need to you, you can use the uh, original deep net code, and then and, and uh, basically you can you can wrap every code you have before and use this HPO. And you have to tune two. You have to tune two neural networks, right? So you exactly yeah. But you say you put parameters on on everything. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. two two steps, two two depths, two widths, two uh, types of functions. Function, sorry. Okay. Yes, that, that would be something to do to to actually check, okay? Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So for new rocket search, um, here the, the value choice is so, like it, it is used to uh, specify, you know, such as the, the number of neurons for for a specific layer, uh, the, the learning rate, uh, the uh, some some weights and and coefficients. The layer choice because. Um, for, 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 I think for now, this uh, this library, this neural network, the NI library only supports PyTorch for neural network search. And uh, in PyTorch coding, uh, PyTorch considers activation function as another layer. So if you want to build a fully connected neural networks using PyTorch uh, linear, you do that by uh, you know stacking linear layers, activation function layer, linear layers, activation function layers, and and and, and so on. And so, using the layer choice, you can you know you can make activation function also searchable. And also, there are many uh, algorithms for neural neural search algorithms supported by uh, the library. So, like random random search research they are there for HPO, there for hyperparameter optimization, but they're also for neural search. And also, some popular ones proposed recently in the past few years, such as DARS, efficient NS. And also uh, new access using reinforcement learning, and so in this for for this new access uh, part, I'm I'm going to show only one example to demonstrate the, the functionality of this uh, the usage of this library. So I, I consider the very simple 
uh, wave equation with periodic boundary condition and this 1D and this periodic boundary conditions. And the, 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 the interesting part is that the initial conditions looks like this. Uh, so it's discontinuous uh, function. And uh, so the codes, uh, you know, doing NS is, is, is much more complicated than doing HBO using its uh, library. So you need, like I was saying, you need to use their own interface, their own uh, module to specify uh, the search space. So here I'm searching. Uh, okay, so the search space is I'm searching that activity function. Uh, also, the layer specific width. So the, this, in this case, the width is not universal for, for all layers. Different layer had different width and the number of neurons. And the search algorithm I chose for this example is the uh, NIS with reinforcement learning. And the metric here, again, I use the, uh, the training loss. It doesn't have, have to be training loss. I and mean, most of the time it preferred to be magnetic loss, but uh, here I, I only show you know, how, we, how do we use it. And uh, okay, so this is the paper for the new actors with reinforcement learning. Basically, uh, what it does is it, it uses a controller, LCM, another net network to sample this architecture for for the for our model for for the pin, and and then uh, for each architecture it samples, we train it from scratch, and and after training is completed, we obtain the metric, and we use the metric. We treat the metric as kind of a reward to. Uh, update the controller to, for, for, the, for the controller to learn how to sample a good uh, architecture for, for PIP. And uh, okay, so uh, normally when we do uh, when we do PIN, uh, you know, this for acting function, we we we, we, just, we open don't choose ReLU as an active function because ReLU is uh, even though it's it's a really good active function is Continuous, but it's not differentiable at x equal to zero. And when we have uh, PDE, when, when we have derivatives inside the loss function, uh, and the the ReLU active function generally fails to work to to to, to achieve really good uh, training loss. Not to mention to uh, estimate the solution. And but for this case, because the initial condition is a uh, is discontinuous function, I will try. I will see if ReLU can work with. Uh, can really can can performs better uh, than the hyperbolic tendon. Uh, so yeah, so the search space uh, uh, is you know I want I search for the uh, layer specific. There are three hidden layers. I, I search for layer specific uh, width. I also search for the right active function, and the candidates are relevant to the hyperbolic tendon. And so here is the uh, web portal, and I used. I said the max number of trials to be 100. Uh, here, this the uh, learning. I'm sorry, the the NIS algorithm is reinforcement learning, and of course, for reinforcement learning, we need many many episodes to train uh, the model to to learn how to sample good architecture for the for the, for the pin. And 100, I think it seems to me that 100 episodes are not enough. Although to me, you can see that I rank rank it rank all, all the uh, uh, trials. By the uh, the re the rewards the metric the higher the metric is, uh, the better the uh, the performance is. So you can see that even though the the the, the best performance is is not achieved by it's achieved by very early trial, you know, but for for the 33, 30, 36, uh, 31, oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> 93, 96, 91, 98. You can see that the, the, the controllers start to learn, start to sample really good uh, architecture for pin. And so the top three, uh, okay, here, if we decide to use, uh, I, it's kind of tricky. I, I, I don't think it's, uh, this part is really convincing and reasonable, but uh, because this is a tutorial, uh, I, I decided to do this. But for, if you, if you decided to use this uh, reinforcement neural search method, you should trust your, Controller. You know, after the the training of the controller is complete, you should use controller to sample a good architecture and use the architecture to train from scratch. But here I I pick the top three top three from the past trials. So basically, if, even though I use this reinforcement learning algorithm to train to do this neural search, I treat it as a random search. So yeah, it's a uh, uh, 
it's not recommended, but I, I did it anyway. And the top three um, architecture from the past trials uh, or you know, those three. And it's quite surprising that Relu, even though we're using, we're doing pin, uh, the Relu active function is preferred by, uh, you, you know, are, are better uh, in terms of the metric I define. And so on the, on the, on the right is the results I, uh, I obtained using this architecture and activation function to, to, yeah, to obtain the solution to the wave equation, even though uh, we have pin, the red light activation works pretty well in this case. And of course, this is actually very small. And this, the, the, <laughs> it's the five dimension, five dimension, and it's a small search space. Uh, and for, for such small search space, maybe random search or grid search is quite sufficient. And okay, so and this is for NS of using this neural, uh, neural network intelligent library. And this library also supports other, like I was saying, other two main functionalities, model compression for efficient deployment of neural networks. Uh, generally, when, we, when people use it for, for real application, especially in the, uh, for the computer vision community, uh, the training networks are generally very large and, and, and it's really uh, slow for, and, and, and you know, it's not it's in, it's inefficient if we just use the training network. So model compression is for, uh, you know, to, to, to for, for a smaller version, to, to obtain a smaller version of neural networks that uh, can achieve uh, similar results compared to the larger one. And also feature engineering for, sec uh, the, uh, for selecting subset of features when the number of features are very large. And I think this, this part is, um, is, is even more interesting for our applications because uh, for, for operator learning, we, the input, uh, for example, deep net, the, the, the features is, or actually the input to the branch net is there are field. So sometimes maybe we need feature engineering to select useful features from the, uh, the, the input to the branch net to obtain better results. But for now, this library supports the, the two main algorithm that library supports for feature engineering are gradient feature selector and, uh, and a gradient boosting decision tree selector. Therefore, one dimension outputs for, for deep net, we have the output of deep net is so it's not one dimension, it's another field. So maybe we need to come up with our own uh, feature engineering algorithm uh, to achieve better uh, performance. So that's it. This is a uh, very short and true level introduction to this uh, neural network intelligence library. And I find it very useful for the hyperparameter optimization. And okay, so that's it. Do we have any question for this one? Zolgan, that's uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is very useful. I think some of our members should um, should try to uh, learn from. Uh, the, uh, maybe you can do a hands-on tutorial. And um, uh, let me get some volunteers. For example, Kasia. Maybe you can work with Kasia to uh, to uh, do this for a, a, a depot net. Yeah, that she's she's working on instead of. Here, optimizing the deep net, maybe we'll see how the uh, neural intelligence will do it. Uh, Umer has a question. Yeah, I see that. Thank you, uh, George. Thank you, Zogren. I was trying to take notes and it got uh, entered in the chat. Uh, sorry for that. So, Zogren, a lot uh, in on a lot of problems, we are not only interested in the accuracy or the error on the let's say some validation points or so, but also the training time. Right? Is it yeah. possible to have a metric that combines the two? Yeah, yeah, there's a, I, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the hyperband, hyperband, hyperband algorithm. It considers uh, the computational resource you have. So yeah, there are some algorithms and the metrics consider, considering the training uh, time. Yeah. So that's possible to be used with neural yes. networking? Of course. Okay. For, for hyperparameter tuning, yeah, of course. But for neural network search, I, I don't think so. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. And the problem. Hey, uh, I actually have a question. Yeah, um, this is a doubt for Brown. Um, yeah, I'm sitting behind you somewhere. Um, <laughs> you don't need to introduce. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I wanted to ask if, like, there's a mechanism, not only the hyperparameters, but also things like um, overfeed or saturation. Like, 
Do the uh, algorithms know, like if a network saturates because of two less of variables or something like that, it knows to remove it from the grid search and just, you know, continue to the next uh, try or the next uh, next set of hyperparameters? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it depends on the how they implement the algorithms. For, for grid search and random search, of course, they don't know. But for it, maybe there's some, there, there are a lot of uh, searching, not searching, uh, Hyperparameter tuning algorithms, but you know, I think this library only, uh, you know, implements the algorithm. They are not responsible for the, you know, the effective, the uh, the performance of the algorithm. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks. So, okay, I just thought of something else that we did with Apostolos, uh, selecting the um, loss function in different norms. So we there is a very general parameterized uh, loss function that was proposed by Google actually. Uh, mm -hmm. which takes into account all historic, but there's actually continuation, like three, four parameters. Yeah, I don't I think that, that. Yeah, I, I think, I, I I think that can be implemented, right? That, that can be implemented with the... Uh, yeah, of course. Because yeah. That, that's that's a pain. That's a pain. So if we can uh, streamline the process, then people actually will do that. Yeah, 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 of course. And then also for, you know, there, there are a lot of the hyperparameters we can tune or search. Even for, for BPN, for Bayesian neural network, we are, do you remember, we, we, we were worried about the, uh, the prior, for the wisdom yeah. bias, we can source that as well. Right, right, right. Yeah, and there, you know, this uh, this library is, I think it's pretty useful in terms uh, of- how, how much is the complexity? Like if you go from three hyperparameters to six hyperparameters, if you double, how much the cost goes up, do you know? No, it depends on the search space. I, I just told you from three to six. Oh, you, you know, for a single, for single variable from three to six. No, no, three, like, you know, with uh, the depth and activation function, then you add the uh, learning rate, then you add, um, you know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. It depends on the, the, the certain algorithm. When, when we're doing this by hand with uh, Shandian, we okay. actually had, the, and Lulu, I think Lulu is here. Uh, I think we had like eight parameters that we're searching, including the uh, Adam or LBFGS, for example. Yeah, when to that, use, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Lulu, do you, do you remember what, what parameters? Yes, when we have six or seven or eight, we have all of these learning rates, optimization, optimization methods, number of iterations, number of Vs, depths, act, activation function. Um, what else? Oh, initialization. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. Zogren, I had a question. Yes. Yes. Uh, do you think we could identify the self-adaptive weights with this somehow? What do you mean? So, so, you don't need like, to search for hyperparameter for self-adaptive weights. But I mean, it's like a hyperparameter if you have two loss terms, right? Uh, can we find that? Final they're value? constant, yeah. But only if they're constant, right? Not if they're... Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. Yeah, 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 of course. Constant. Yeah, yeah, of course. I think, I think this library provides easy you know, not, not easy usage of those algorithms. So we can, it never doesn't harm to try. Okay. Yeah. Umar, I think uh, I, you, you have yeah, a question. I just had a follow-up question. Yeah. So I was wondering if it's possible to also uh, search for the best training points in the domain. Of course, of course. Yeah, yeah. But uh, before that, you, you need to specify all the candidates for the training points. Exactly. Yeah. Romulo, uh, Lulu and Romulo, are, 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 Lulu has a paper on that, uh, but he's doing that manually. Mm. And then Romulo also has some, uh, I don't know if Rom is uh, still uh, with us, but yeah, here he is. So so he, uh, Rom, maybe, maybe you can try this. Yeah, I mean, for selecting like the best approach or the best sampling technique or... Yeah, yeah, from, from the market you yep. have, instead of you, you know, painstaking, <laughs> painstaking. Yes. <laughs> okay, I mean, sure, I could try that. Oh, sorry, I have one question. So, can this library support, let's say, distributed learning? If I have a few machines, I try to parallel this search. Is this possible? I think it is, but I, I didn't try. I use my own machine, machine to do to do all the experiments. Okay. Yeah. Any other question? 
Okay, so yeah, this is it for, for this week's Quantum Nerd. Thanks, Ogren. This is really useful. So, uh, of course, it will work, works against you because uh, when uh, we automate the process, then we'll fire all the graduate students. So, uh, but uh, thanks for uh, telling us about uh, uh, neural network intelligence. No problem. Uh, okay, so everyone has a good weekend. Uh, see you next week. Bye. Bye bye.